So like, is cup holding kosher? This is And God Was Like, Alma's Weekly Torah Portion Series. I'm your host, Ariel Kaplan. This week's parsha is Nasa, in English that means to take a census or lift up. Let's get right into it. The Mishkan is starting to look really fucking gross. God tells Moses to make a chore sheet for all of the temple employees, naturally. Let's just skip to the next chapter. God is like, Moses, there's so many gross people in my camp. I can't take it. There's people ejaculating. They've got fucking discharge in their pantaloons. And there's people that are like talking to the dead. I want him gone. This is a safe space. I don't feel safe. Ew, of course. So Moses gets rid of them. God's like, oh, phew, okay, now we can get to other business. I want you to tell the Israelites that if anybody sins, I want them to feel like really, really bad about it because I'm going to take it super personally. It's like, God, not everything is about you. <laughs> so now God is like, Moses, 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 I have an amazing idea for a reality TV show. Cheaters, but make it biblical. So here is where we get into the ordeal of the bitter water. It's also called the ordeal of jealousy. In the Talmud, Isha so is a tractate that deals with the ancient ritual of catching an adulteress. Sounds hot. It's absolutely not. Here's the lowdown. There's an Agadah, which is like Jewish myth, that describes a story of identical sisters, Bakora and Sota. Sota's husband is like, I think Sota is cheating on me. And Sota's like, I totally am, but he can't find out or I'll die. Sota runs over to her identical twin sister, Bakora, and she's like, yo, you gotta help me out. And Bakora's like, I'm down. Let's fucking smash the patriarchy. Unbeknownst to the husband, Bakora takes Sota's place. She goes to the Jewish court she drinks this potion that's supposed to either reveal that she's an adulteress and kill her or make her pregnant. But Cora drinks the potion, obviously she's fine, and then she runs over to Sota, they're like, yay! They kiss for some reason. When Sota's lips touch the poison, she explodes and dies. So this was almost a really nice story about the sisterhood overcoming the patriarchy. Ultimately, this is a story about feminine loyalty never being triumphant over the masculine rule of law. Just another day in the life. Step one. So if the husband thinks that his wife is cheating, he's gotta be like, hey you, I want you to cut that out. He's gotta warn her basically. And if she does it again, he can say, all right, you got two options. Drink this potion that might kill you or we get a divorce. So if the wife is like, bitch, you crazy crazy, I accept, then the man will bring his wife to the court of law. He will also bring two offerings, one of them being a meal offering. And then the meal offering is just going to be flour, no frankincense in it because frankincense is associated with women and we hate women here. Step three, the woman is going to drink this potion that the high priest concocts. It's like holy water, dirt from the ground, what the fuck, <laughs> dissolve a piece of parchment in the water, which also has some like other weird things like toenails. Just kidding, I don't know, maybe. So if the wife drinks this and she's guilty, her belly will swell, her thigh will sag, and she'll just fucking explode into a million pieces. If she's not guilty, God will bless her with a son in 10 months, her daughter. Can the woman refuse to drink this potion? If the parchment hasn't dissolved yet in the water, she can say, you know what, fuck this shit, I'm not doing it, it's weird. The only thing is that then she has to divorce her husband and she won't get money from that ketubah deal. Rashi, the like OG rabbi celebrity commentator, he's got a lot of things to say about this. This rule doesn't apply to blind men or a husband who willfully closes his eyes to it. So like, is cup holding kosher? Rashi notes that the text repeats that the woman will be brought forth to the priest. This is repeated because it was actually a tactic used to confuse a woman by like moving her around different places and interrogating her. Sounds very familiar. And also that the priest will mess up the woman's hair. And this is where the idea that married women should be covering their hair at all times comes from. Imagine the high priest coming over to you and just like, giving you a nuggie. <laughs> so this ordeal isn't really used today and that's dope. Chapter six, God explains what a Nazarite is. A Nazarite is basically a goody two shoes who's like, I know you love God, but like I love God the most. But really a Nazarite is someone who's just like super holy unto God. And to become a Nazarite, there is a hazing process. You can't drink wine or anything from a grapevine. You can't cut your hair and you can't come in contact with the dead. If somebody does suddenly die next to you, then you just have to like cut off your hair and do like a whole little ritual to be pure again. At the end of this hazing process, which could last like 30 days or longer, the Nazarite will take a dip in the mikvah, make three offerings, burnt peace and sin, and burn his hair as an offering to God for some reason. Rabbis think that the Nazarite had to make a sin offering because Nazarites are kind of like a bad boy, which is so true because one of the only Nazarites mentioned in the Torah is Samson of Samson and Delilah. Yes, the hunk 
with a hair who is really strong. Just watch the movie with Hedy Lamarr, okay? It's amazing. Samson is like the baddest of boys. His mom, Hannah, made him a Nazarite just by being like, he's gonna be a Nazarite. So by the way, anybody can be one if you just say, I am a Nazarite forever. Of course, you have to do the hazing process. Let's say Samson just walked past me and I was like, same. Now I'm a Nazarite. So now God is like, all right, I'm totally shifting gears. I want to talk about Birkat Kohenim. It's a super simple way that the Kohenim, the holy high priests, can bless Israel. God tells Moses to tell Aaron to tell the Israelites this cute prayer. May God bless you and protect you. May God deal kindly and graciously with you. May God bestow his favor upon you and grant peace. This sounds like we have a lot of apologizing to do. Even after the destruction of the second temple, Birkat Kohanim is still used today, except it's called Dushaning. Duchening. It's used today basically to get like an air hug from God and Aaron. In synagogue at the end of the service, the rabbi or the chazan is going to yell, Kohanim. The Kohanim will leave the service. The Levites will wash their hands as per usual, and then the Kohanim come back without their shoes because that's a thing in Judaism. And then they put on their talits over their head and then they put their hands in the Hebrew letter Shin like this. So yes, this is the Spock sign from Star Trek. Actor Leonard Nimoy was Jewish and he used to like peek under his dad's tali, which like obviously you weren't supposed to do and he would see the Kohanim making the sign. So once the Kohanim finished the prayer, they were like, yo God, we did the thing, now you have to like do your thing. I don't know if that thing ever actually happened. They can't say the blessing if they had any wine. To make sure that Kohanim don't get drunk, the blessing isn't said in the afternoon mincha services just in case the Kohanim got like super wasted at luncheon. Chapter 7, Israel and the Mishkan sitting in a tree. P-R-A-Y-I-N-G. Moses finally finishes the Mishkan. Woo! I really thought that it had been finished this entire time. This chapter marks the wedding between Israel and the Mishkan. All the heads of the tribes of Israel bring offerings to God. You know, we got the usual money, animals, flour, incense, gold, silver. It's like super easy to shop for God. God's like, I want all those presents actually to go to the Mishkan employees. So everybody gets something to help them carry the traveling tent, except for the Kohathites, because what they carry is on their shoulders. And God's like, you thought. Moses is like, all right, I'm going to just go into the Mishkan and talk to God like I usually do. And he hears this voice coming out of like the Ark of the testimony. This Torah text study asks, what do you think God's voice sounds like? And I really want to believe that it sounded like Darth Vader from Spaceballs 2. <laughs> I can't breathe in this thing! The voice is actually super loud and scary. The cool thing is that the Mishkan is soundproof, so nobody hears it. Rashi has a commentary that Moses heard God talking to himself, and I need to know what he was saying. Next, Next week, week I'm, I'm covering Baha'u'llah, which means when you raise the lamps. Shit gets real. Miriam and Aaron talk shit about Moses. Shabbat Shalom, see you next week. Oh, yeah. Whee! Oh, I can just...